So chapter one is more of introduction and history and the main themes of microbiology. Uh, generally speaking, microbiology will be talking about microorganisms. Microorganisms are the organisms that are too small to see it with your eye. You have to use a, some sort of magnification, whatever the magnification is. We can magnify twice, three times, ten times, hundred, thousand, whatever the number is. But you cannot see it with your eyes anyway. So this list is important to know. What is a microorganism and why did you call it microorganism? Because it's micro, it's too small. You can't see it with your eyes. You have to magnify. Bacteria, virus, fungus, protozoa, helminthes, also known as worms, and algae. So these are the six microorganisms you need to remember. Anything else that's not one of those six is not a microorganism. Okay? This is generally speaking. Um, microbiology occupations there. There, there are different types. You can be a uh, biotechnology, my, um, uh, microbiology, immunologist, uh, public health, environmental health, um, uh, microbiology, agriculture, a lot of different types. This is just uh, listing the, the different occupations, nothing that's very important in this one. Um, so follow with me as we go, I will tell you. Like the previous, it's just, just an idea, okay? But Something like this, this is important, okay? Uh, and I'm ha highlighting as we go. Six types, you have to remember the six types and what does it mean to be microorganism, okay, so far? Uh, there are two cell lines in microbiology. There is a prokaryote and eukaryote. Pro and eu and karyote. You have three things to know here. What's pro and what's eu and what's karyote? Pro means primitive or before. U, EU means normal or classic. Karyot means nucleus. So when you say prokaryote, it means before the development of nucleus. It's too primitive that it doesn't even have a nucleus. Did you get the idea? This is called prokaryote. So when you say prokaryotes are like bacteria and archaea, does bacteria and archaea have a nucleus? No. The nucleus, classic, I'm talking about the classic nucleus. Don't misunderstand. Classic nucleus means genetic material within a nuclear membrane, right? This is the nucleus. But does that mean that they do not have genetic material? No, they do. They do. But not within a nucleus. Not surrounded by a membrane. Is that clear enough? Prokaryotes. And you need to know this. Prokaryotes, what does it mean? especially if um, uh, the, the nucleus part like it's unicellular organisms there are organelles in there within membranes and everything but what's the main theme or the most important in this to remember does not have a classic nucleus what do you mean by classic nucleus i mean a membrane bound genetic material genetic material inside a membrane so it means they do have genetic material not in a membrane so you cannot call it a nucleus Clear so far? These are prokaryotes, and there are two examples, bacteria and archaea. You need to know that. Eukaryote, on the other hand, means the classic one, the normal one. It does have a nucleus. Obviously, the genetic material is going to be within a nuclear membrane. And this includes animals, plants, fungi, and protists. You need to know this, and you need to remember all these names. Okay? Virus, on the other hand, it's acellular. What do you mean acellular? I mean nothing. None of what we mentioned. None. No, no nucleus. No cytoplasm. No organelles. No membrane. None of those. So the viruses do not belong to any one of the kingdoms that we will, will be talking about. The virus is completely different. It's just nucleic acid and protein. That's it. It's not even a cell. It does not have any cellular structure. Clear? Just genetic material and some protein around it. That's it. So does the virus belong to any kingdom? No, it does not. It's just some genetic material surrounded by 
uh, protein. So if you look at this, it's showing you the nucleic acid inside, surrounded by a capsid, and the capsid is the protein. Nucleic acid, protein around it, and envelope at the outside. That's it. It's not even a cell. And being just genetic material with some protein and envelope around it, it's not a cell, obviously, so they survive within our cells, within any cells in general, not necessarily ours, animals or anything else. So they have to, 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 they have to live like a parasite. They have to live inside the cells because they are not cells. So they don't have the tools to do anything. Um, this part, it's just, just take a look at it. It's, it's not something that's, I mean, we will go through these details in, in uh, next chapters. But if you look at this, there are different types of microbes. It's just showing you uh, an example of bacteria, like uh, Microbacterium TB that's rod-shaped. Um, this one is just giving you an example of fungus. We mentioned the types of microorganisms, right? And I told you, it's, remember, it's important to remember these names that's considered microorganisms. Anything in, uh, not in this list is not a microorganism. So we said bacteria, we got an example, just look at it. Uh, fungus, example of that is Histoplasma capsulatum, okay? Uh, algae, what's the example of algae? These different types of algae. Uh, this, uh, the the desmides. Uh, the spirog spirogera filaments, uh, the diatoms, and so on. Just examples. Just take a look at it. Uh, so far, no details. So just take a look at it. Right? Uh, this is an example of virus, herpes simplex. It's an example of virus. Uh, next is a protozoa. Something like uh, the triphallux. This is an example of protozoa. This, this is an example of helminthes. And what's helminthes means? Worms. worms. Yes. So this is an example of worms. Round worm is an example. It's a, it's a worm that's round. And this is where the name came from. Lactrocanella spiralis. Uh, this is um, a, a worm that comes from the pork. If, if somebody's eating a pork that's not well cooked, you can get this. So, nothing important on all these six slides, not, not a big deal, just take a look at it. Details will be done later on, so don't worry much about it. Um, this is very important to know. What's biotechnology, what's genetic engineering, and what's bioremediation? All these three are the different uses of the microorganisms. Microorganisms are not necessarily harmful, right? can be beneficial, it can not be doing anything, and it can be harmful as well, right? But there are uses for those. How can we use the microorganisms? The first use is in biotechnology. We are using it. It's not bad. Not all of it is bad. There is part of it is bad, which we call it the pathogenic microorganisms. Other than that, it's not bad. We use it. A biotechnology, as an example, like you, eat, like you produce food. Cheese, you know that we, for, to do cheese, beer, um, yogurt, right? Are, you're using organisms. So this is the good organisms. Uh, the, and when we call that biotechnology, you're using the technology to use these organisms for other uses, for good uses. Food, like cheese and beer, uh, probiotics, probiotic yogurt, if you used that before, uh, the detergent, they started to add enzymes to break down the fat, for example. And where did you get these enzymes? It's from the microorganisms. So this is a good use, and we call it biotechnology. The other one is genetic engineering. What's a genetic engineering? You're engineering the genes of the microorganisms. You're changing the genes. You're playing with the genes of the microorganisms to produce a new product. And this new product can help you to cure some diseases. So you get that organism, you play in the genes, you engineer the genes, okay? You change it, the genes, 
to change it to another organism that's doing something good for you. So this is a new product, an, an organism that's helping you. Somebody have a genetic disease, he's overproducing something. So you produce a microorganism that take care of it, cure the disease. So this is called genetic engineering. So remember genetic engineering, you're engineering the genes of the organisms. You're changing the genes of the organisms. The third one is called bioremediation. And bioremediation means you're using the organisms for environmental problems. And I think we experienced that a couple of years ago, if you remember, with that oil spill. Mm -hmm. And they said, okay, we are going to add organisms on it and these organisms will take care of it, will wipe it off. Uh, oil spells, for example, the microorganisms are going to degrade, to de degrade that oil. And they did it, they used it. They said, okay, don't worry about it, we will take care of that oil spell. The added organisms, the organisms degraded that oil and they cleaned it. So this is bioremediation. So all three here are important. These are important uses of the microorganisms. A uh, lifestyle of the, of the microorganisms. Obviously, these organisms can be free in the environment and they can live within a host, right? Uh, a lot of these microorganisms are not even harmful. Some of them are beneficial. Some of them are not doing anything but some of them are harmful. The harmful ones only are called the pathogenic ones. Other than that, it's not harmful. Uh, they can be parasites. When you say parasite, it means they live on the body of another organism. This is called parasite. The virus is parasite by nature, but the, mi the other microorganisms can be or not. An example of that is malaria. AIDS, where the malaria lives? The malaria lives in our red blood cells, right? So this is considered a type of parasite. It's not a virus. We know that malaria is not a virus, right? But it still can be a parasite. So parasite is anything that, that cannot live on its own, okay? It has to live within a cell of somebody else, of, an, of other organism. And they are always harmful. Like malaria, you know what will happen with malaria? They live in the red blood cells. So we call it parasite, right? Uh, AIDS, they live in uh, one of the types of the T lymphocytes, right? The helper. They live inside the cell. So what ultimately will happen to that cell? It will be d destroyed, right? So this, these parasites, they have to be harmful. They don't live inside the cells and keep it. They live inside and then destroy it and then move to another cell, okay? It does not coexist. They destroy it. It's almost harmful. So the only the ones that are harmful, we call it the pathogens or the pathogenic organisms. Okay? And this is one of the types. Uh, there are like 2,000 types of microbes that cause disease. Um, these numbers are, look at it. I mean, just understand that pathogenic means the patho means disease, genic means generating or causing. So pathogenic microorganisms means the organism that cause disease. That's it. Numbers are interesting. Take a look at it. But um, too much to ask about these numbers. Uh, this table is also something just to look at. Um, too much to ask about these numbers, you cannot memorize the numbers. It's just something to look at it, like it's showing you influenza being on top. For example, new cases, three to five millions, and um, a quarter of a million to a half million die from influenza. Typhoid fever, 21,000 and 200 and so on. Measles, HIV, uh, the dengue fever, the shigellosis, viral hepatitis, malaria, TB, and so on. Just interesting number to look at it. Um, uh, not much for uh, details to ask about, like numbers too much, okay? Um, neglected tropical diseases. These are the diseases, especially in tropical areas, but it can be anywhere else. That they, they don't worry much about it, they don't talk about it, it's neglected, 
but it does exist, especially in certain countries, less developed countries, basically. Uh, something like Asteriasis, like a lot of us don't even know what's Asteriasis in the first place. Uh, the hookworm, uh, uh, the lymphatic filariasis. Filariasis is coming from elephant. The person looks like an elephant because they block the, uh, uh, the lymphatics. Schistosomiasis, trachoma, and so on. So these are just diseases, tropical diseases to look at. Uh, the historical foundation of microbiology, this part will be important um, starting from here. This is the history. What we see now is after hundreds of years of work, right? So at the very, very beginning, they thought that there is something called spontaneous generation. What's spontaneous generation? The name gave it away. You're generating something spontaneously, like you're generating a living organism from non-living material. This is obviously not true, right? But this is what they thought in the beginning. They think like um, the manure, for example, and they found flies coming out of it. Okay, so the, 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 enzyme, the flies are coming from the manure, which is a non-living, right? Um, it's non-living manure. So they thought so. But it turned out to be false at the end. They just didn't know. But is it a theory that, that they used to believe on? Yes, spontaneous generation. So what's spontaneous generation? Generation spontaneously. They thought it's coming from non-living. Living come from non-living. Obviously that's pro proven to be wrong at the end. Um, so how um, who proved it to be wrong? It's uh, Louis, Louis Pasteur. Louis Pasteur. Uh, so Louis Pasteur, he disapproved that spontaneous generation. He said, no, that's not true. He said, there is a theory of pyogenesis. This is the truth. This is the truth. It's not spontaneous generation, but we still have to know it. Even though it's proved wrong, but we still have to know it. Spontaneous generation. He said, no, spontaneous generation is not true, but he studied the spontaneous generation, he, he worked on it until he proved it wrong. And he said, no, no, the, the truth is biogenesis. The living organism does not come from the non-living organism. They actually come from other living things, but you didn't see it. Did you get the idea? Um, scientists and what they do is very important to know. What Louis Pasteur did, for example. First, as you see here, number one, he disapproved spontaneous generation. He made the theory of biogenesis. Uh, what's biogenesis? Living come from living. It's biogenesis. Bio, create another bio. Uh, living, create another living. Uh, next scientist. is uh, Van Leeuwenhoek, and Van Leeuwenhoek, he was a Dutch linen merchant. He is the first one to observe living microorganisms. He called it in the beginning animalcules, animalcules, like the small animals, okay? Irrespective of, this was a history and most of it proved wrong, but that's okay, you have to know the history, okay? So when you see this name, Van Leeuwenhoek, what should we remember about him? An, an animal cules, which is, he's, he's the first one to observe the living microorganisms. He called it animal cues. And he is the one that st uh, started the single lens magnification up to 300 times of magnification. So this is very important to remember. Living microorganisms, who observed them and he called them animal cues. Um, He's a Dutch linen merchant, and he started that uh, single lens magnification, which was, of course, was uh, 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 they worked on it, and they changed it, and they made a lot of progress, but still, uh, we need to know what he did. And uh, next one is Louis Pasteur, and Louis Pasteur, we talked about the first part, which is 
He worked on the spontaneous generation. He worked on it to prove it wrong. He proved it wrong at the end. And he said, living come from living. So when they asked him, what do you mean? Like, why the flies come out of the manure if the manure is not living? Where, where did it come from? He said, no, no, no. It's coming from the air. He just didn't see it. Okay? Like from the air, they put the eggs on the manure and the flies come. So you think it is coming from the manure? It's not. It's in the air. Maybe dust or something that um, came to the manure and the, uh, and then the flies came out of it at the end. So he said, which is the, the uh, uh, disapproving the spontaneous generation, he said it's coming from the air. That's what it is. Okay? This is one. Uh, he started the germ theory of the disease. Germ theory means there is a germ that produces disease. I'm just making it as simple as possible. We will talk about it. But this is called the germ theory. Before that, I think we all heard about this. They used to say the disease is coming from um, evil and bad uh, intentions and bad work and all that stuff that we hear about. He said, no, that's not true. They come from germs. Germ theory. Um, he also showed my um, uh, microbes. Um, cause fermentation and spoilage um, and he developed pasteurization and pasteurization is coming from his name Pasteur uh, I think we know this he heated up all of a sudden and then he cooled it down all of a sudden this is called pasteurization these names are important to know in the history okay for this chapter um, so fermentation and spoilage, pasteurization, germ theory, and spontaneous generation. This is what he did. So what's the germ theory? The germ theory is diseases come from microbes. Not from sins and bad character and, pover and poverty and all that stuff. It comes actually from microbes. So this is called the germ theory of the disease. Disease comes from germ. Disease comes from microbes, not from anything else. And uh, the other scientist who helped in this germ theory is Koch, Robert Koch. Okay, you need to remember these names. Both of them, they work together in the germ theory. So Robert Koch uh, What did he do? Uh, Koch did, uh, he established something called the Koch uh, postulate um, by which he verified the germ theory So germ theory is a collaborative work between Pasteur and Koch Pasteur started Koch verified it. Okay, so when you hear germ theory, it's a collaboration between those two. This is one. Number two, he did a lot of experiments until he established the link between the disease and causative agents. This microbe is causing this disease. Okay, at the beginning, this virus is causing hepatitis. This TB um, uh, is, um, uh, organism is causing the TB disease and so on. So he linked those together. This specific microbe is causing this specific disease by doing some experiments. And he is the one who identified anthrax, TB, and cholera. It was not, this is how important his work is. Uh, this was not a, a known disease to, uh, to, to, uh, to the scientist, and he found it, discovered it, and he talked about it. Uh, and he developed something called, called pure culture, pure culture method. It's coming. But generally speaking, pure culture means a culture that's pure for one microbe only. 
I can get this culture that have several microbes. I ended up having only one. So we can look at it and study it more. Is that clear so far? Yes, you will be asked about this. This is important to know. What did each one of those did? Um, scientific method is very important topic that we will be using later on and we have to understand the basics. And the scientific method is basically start with observation. I notice something, okay? So, and then I make a hypothesis. A hypothesis means an tentative, a tentative explanation that can be supported or refuted. So uh, uh, as long as hypothesis, it's not a theory yet, okay? I think, like I notice something in the hand of somebody. I notice this swelling in, in the hand. This is um, an observation, right? I noticed it. So I then I start to study it and pay close attention until I come with hypothesis. Hypothesis doesn't mean it's true. This is just what I think. I think it may be coming from the cow. Why did you notice that? I noticed uh, this milk made, for example. It's coming, the example. This is exactly what happened. Um, I am a scientist and I'm going to make a hypothesis what I'm going to do. Here's what I'm going to do. Uh, this lady, the milkmaid, is milking the cow. I noticed something in the cow and she had something similar. This is my observation, right? My hypothesis is she got it from the cow, right? Touching the cow, it come to her skin and caused her the same issue, okay? And this is my hypothesis. Is it true or false? Not yet. This is too early. Are we following? Is it true or false? I don't know yet. This is what I think. I think that after observing something, I made a hypothesis. It can be supported, it can be refuted. You, you need to work on it. So next step is, it's still a hypothesis. It doesn't mean anything. This is what, just what I'm thinking. Okay? Uh, now let's work on it. Let's do some experiments, either to support or refute. So when you do the experiments and you find it wrong, it's gone. It was a hypothesis, it's, it's wrong. If you can support it with experiments, now you will say, okay, yeah, that was true. It was supported. So you need to move to the next step after hypothesis, which is experimentation. You do experiments. So you get somebody else, for example, and have him deal with the cow and see if the same thing will happen or not. Get, examine this and examine that, see if it is too similar or not, and so on. So he did some experiments and did some analysis and did some testing to support or refute. If you supported, if you, if you did all these tests, experiments, analysis, and you supported it, you're moving it to the next step. Which is that you will say it is true. You support it. Let's say you supported it. You did all the work needed and you supported it. What's the next step? You need to publish the results. Um, and when you publish it, it will be repeated by other investigators. So all of this until now, even after you publish it, it's not a theory yet. It's not proven yet. Even when you, when you do the work, when you do experiment, when you do the test, you do the analysis, you do all of that. And you, you see that you supported your hypothesis and you published it. It's still not proven yet, right? How to prove it after publishing it? It has to be repeated by other investigators, and other investigators will sit, find the same findings that, that you found. Is that clear so far? So these are the steps. The steps are important the, the same way I'm saying it, okay? So at the end, if you, if you found a growing body of evidence, you found other investigators finding the same thing, uh, they did a lot of experiments, a lot of things to uh, prove it. Now, the next level of confidence is called theory. Theory. Uh, is, is that okay so far? So, it's observation. I noticed something, right? And then I made an, a hypothesis. Uh, this is what I think. How did you notice it? I, um, uh, I observed, I made the link, I did it, uh, and so on. And then you do, you do tests and, and uh, analysis and experiments, and still, you publish it and still not yet. Even after you publish it, not yet. 
Other investigators have to do the same work and they have to challenge it. And at the end, if it is everybody says it's, it's okay, it's right, now it's a theory. Okay? Um, Hook is a scientist who, the first one to describe cells. So this is something that you also need to remember. Okay? Each scientist is doing something that you need to remember. We will come to it. Um, this is just a, a story. So it's not very important, just to prove the point. But you got what you need to know already, okay? So the following six slides are just a story. It's, gi it's giving you how it goes, just to, un to make sure that you understood. But what the, the previous two slides is what you have to know. Clear? So this is just um, uh, telling you the steps. So let's start with the first one. Observation and information gathering. So this is something that actually happened. Dr. Jenner, he found it. Uh, a form of pox that's similar to small box, okay? He found it in the milkmaids, and he said, uh, it looks like the same one in the, in the cows. It looks like, I don't know. He's just, it's just an observation. Next step, he did the hypothesis. He said, okay, that small box in that lady, it looks like the same one in the cow. So obviously it's because she's dealing with it and she's not protecting, protected. So obviously by touching, she got it. It looks the same and so on. So he did the hypothesis. Hypothesis, is that true or false? We don't know yet, okay? So he start the test and experiments, which is the third step. The first one is he got a scrap, like he, he got this lesion from the cow. He scrapped it, uh, the blisters, he scrapped the blisters. Uh, from the milkmaid and he got one of the boys and he inoculated that. He got the scrap and he put it in another uh, boy. And this boy had ended up having minor symptoms but he is not infected. Not like he got it, he put it in his hand and he got the whole small box. No. He just got a little bit, like a tiny spot. Okay? So he moved to the next step, another experiment. Uh, the child was exposed twice uh, to pass from active smallpox, smallpox lesion. And he didn't have anything. So from that observation and from that, he was, he was not expecting that. He was not working for that. He was just this. I think this small box is coming from the cow. That's it. That's what he thought. And he made a hypothesis. It's coming by direct contact, unprotected contact with the cow. And this is how the, the milkmaid got it. This is his theory. But accidentally, accidentally, while he's working on this, and the child got a little bit, and then he's exposed to the disease, he didn't get anything after that. This is accidentally, the, this is how they found the vaccine. Okay? We know the vaccine, right? Hepatitis vaccine, they give you a little dose, you get a little bit of, not the actual disease, you get something, a little bit of reaction, and then you're protected, right? Measles, mumps, and so on. This was the basics. It was accidental. accidental. Um, the next step is repu re uh, reproducibility. Uh, and this is one of the characteristics. You have to be able to reproduce it. Not you do it one time and you say, I'm done. No, you have to repeat it and, you, and, and, and to prove it, it's, it's happening. So he started to do inoculate other two subjects, um, uh, like 23, whatever the number is. Um, he inoculated others and the same results happened. He got many boys this time, rather than one, and he did the same thing and all protected. So he reproduced it. Then he published it, and they did a lot of experiments and tests to prove it. And um, this was the beginning of the vaccination. And vaccination is coming from vaca, uh, which is cow, which is obviously not a very right name because it's later on it can come from humans, it can come from biotechnology, it can come from horse, whatever it is. But because this is the first time to find it, so this was the basis of vaccine. 
And then the next step, it became a theory and it became widespread. All countries started to use it. They started to do it in different ways. They started to develop it even more. Like in the beginning, that was it. All what, the only vaccine was available is, I give you a little bit of that uh, virus or that organism. Later on, they did biosynthesis, they did separation, they did something similar. So it started to become widespread. And by the vaccine, uh, smallpox was eradicated. Uh, in 1979, it's eradicated. No more smallpox. Okay? The, this whole six slides theory is to prove what we talked about before. And what we talked about before is the important one. Observation, hypothesis, experiments, prove your point, publish it, repeat it, reproducible, okay? Other scientists or investigators prove your point and then it become a theory, okay? So uh, all this story is just to apply what we learned, but what we learned is, the mo is, is important. Am I being clear enough? Did you get my idea? This is all what you have to know. The whole story is just a story, just to prove it, okay? Um, the, other things, uh, the other thing is spores and sterilization. How did they find found out about this? A scientist called Tyndall, John Tyndall, and another one that's called Ferdinand Kahn, the, both of them, they found out a heat-resistant microbes, meaning it is a microbe, they exposed it to heat, it didn't die. So they, they were like wondering, what is this? How is it that resistant to heat? So later on, they call it the endospores. Example of that is TB. And if you remember from pathophysiology, we all did pathophysiology, right? So if you remember from pathophysiology, if somebody's having TB and I'm coughing and the sputum got on, on, um, uh, on the floor, with the dust and everything, and everybody's going on it, and heat and everything, still there, right? So the heat did not destroy it. How the heat did not destroy it? Because it's an endospore. It's not the actual bacteria. It's the bacteria shrinking and applying more covers and become an endospore. So develop the endospore. Tyndall and Kahn. From that point, they said, okay, so if there is something that's heat resistant, we call it the endospore. How can we get rid of everything? Meaning everything, including the endospores. They came to the sterilization or sterility. And sterility means eliminating all life forms. Everything, 100%, nothing stays. We call it sterilization. Including the endospores, that's heat resistant, and even virus and viral particles. So when you, when you are in a lab or something and you say, this specimen is sterile. What do you mean? I mean, everything is wiped off. No life at all. If, even including the endospores, yes. You find a way to get rid of it. And even the virus and even the viral particles, not even a whole virus. Did you get the sterility? Sterility is wiping off 100%, including endospores and virus and virus particles. Um, the other scientist, which is Wendell Holmes, he noticed that the mothers of home birth have fewer infection than those in the hospital. That's, that was at that time. Of course, now it's the opposite, right? But we're talking about history now. He noticed, it's just an um, uh, observation. He uh, observed 10 pregnant ladies who are delivering, giving birth at home, and other 10 that are giving birth at hospitals. They found the ones that at home are less than one in the hospitals. Until Another scientist, that's, um, his name is um, Ignaz Semmelweis, and Semmelweis noticed the following. He said the same thing as Holmes, okay? He noticed the same thing. 
So this is his nullification. But he came with hypothesis. What's the hypothesis? He said, this is exactly what he did. He said, okay, uh, um, uh, Holmes found this observation. Let me look at it. Yes, I found the same thing. I see that ladies that are delivering home uh, with a midwife or, 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 or somebody at home, they have less infections than tho those in the hospital. It's not supposed to be like that. So this is an observation. So he worked on it. He said, okay, why this is happening? Uh, and he noticed that the doctors in the hospital and the medical students in the hospital, they are dealing with autopsy at the same time that they are dealing with patients, okay? So he said that the infection is coming actually from doctors and medical students. Of, cu of course, they, they, they fought him so hard. He said, you, you, you're an idiot, you're crazy. What are you talking about? We are giving uh, infection to, 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 to the ladies who are delivering, that's crazy. But he said, well, give me another explanation. Why at home is, is better than at hospital? There has to be an explanation. And I noticed that you guys are dealing with autopsy. So that, that, that would be the reason that you're not cleaning before dealing with the patients. So he said, all of us, we have to use chlorine water before delivering babies. So that blood poisoning that was, uh, blood bo poisoning is uh, purpura. Are we familiar with the purpura? The purpural sepsis? The fever that come to the ladies after, that might come to ladies after delivery. We heard about this. They call it blood poisoning, but now they call it the purpura or the purpural sepsis. Um, so that's what he noticed. Of course, they fought him so hard and he said, you're crazy, but he was proven right. And from that point, he started to use this. But you, really, you, remember, you need to remember uh, Semmelweis for chlorinated water, chlorine water. Okay, then this is what you need to memorize. Semmelweis, chlorine water. Semmelweis, chlorine water. And he is the one that said, you got the infection from the autopsy to the patients, to the, to the uh, mother's delivery. Okay? Later on, another scientist whose name is Lester, he introduced the aseptic technique. He said, let's work on it, and we, used to, we need to use disinfectant before using anything. And they call that the antiseptic surgery. And he is the one who used heat for, for sterilization as well. You need to remember this. So what's Lester? When you hear Lester, what should you remember? Aseptic. Aseptic antiseptic surgery, disinfectant, heat for sterilization. Uh, similar wise, what should you remember? Chlorine water, I'm giving you the clues, okay? And uh, autopsy, doctors and medical students transferred it from autopsy to the delivering ladies. Is that clear? Uh, the next part is about Taxonomy. And taxonomy is when you organize, classify, and name. Three things. Organize, classify, and name. Uh, this is a system that was, de was developed, and the names that we're using right now, uh, Mycobacterium TB, uh, 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 Staphylococcus aureus. All these names came from this system that they developed, which is taxonomy. So taxonomy is that uh, organization, classification, and naming in general, which, uh, which was organized by Linney. He did not develop it, but he organized it. So what you're, using, what you're doing here is you classify the organisms, you assign names, and then you identify. Okay? Classify, assign names, identify. All three is taxonomy. What's nomenclature? Nomenclature, nomen, is it, is it similar to name? Nomen, name, right? So nomenclature is part of the taxonomy. Is that clear? Nomenclature, nomen, name, nomen, name. So nomenclature is assigning a name only. 
But when you classify, you assign name, identify all together, this is taxonomy, which is that whole uh, science. Here's an example of taxonomy. How are you going to classify and organize status kingdom, phylum, class, order, family, and then you go to genesis and species. Species is the last one. So if you take it from the other way, from, from down going up, details are not the most important. This is just an example. Okay? So what I want you to know from this part is this arrangement. Okay, from above going down or from down going up, what's the, the largest is kingdom. In this kingdom, you have multiple phylums. You take one of these phylums and you will find, you, you classify it into classes. Each class, you classify it into orders. Each order has families. Each family will contain genesis and species. Those last two, and pay attention to this, this is important. The last two, what's the smallest of this? The, the largest is kingdom. What's the smallest? Species. Species is the smallest of all. But the name come from, you will see all these names later on, come from those two. Okay? So when you say Staphylococcus aureus, Mycobacterium TB, what is that? It is Genesis and Species. Clear? This is where the name came from. What does it belong to? Yes, family, order, class, phylum, kingdom. Start from the kingdom. This is a kingdom, the kingdom of Protesta, for example. A phylum of that is uh, the Clio 4. Um, uh, a class of that, and then an order of that, and so on. The details are not the most important, but it's extremely important to know that order and to know that the largest is kingdom and you go down with it in that specific order. And it's important to know that you have, th that the name comes from those last two, okay? This is another example here, you can take a look at it, but it's basically the same thing. This is the kingdom of animalata. Phylum, and then go to class, an order, family, and a genesis species. Genesis species is the one, the one that you're going to uh, use as a scientific name. As you see here, Homo sapiens, genesis and species. Okay? Genesis is Homo sapiens is species. Did you get the idea? So the name comes from genesis and species. Genesis and species. This is where the, all the names will come from. Uh, this is just to help you guys remember because you have to remember it. So it's kingdom, phylum, class, order, family, gen um, uh, genus, and species. King Philip came over for good spaghetti. Okay? Just something to help you remember. But you have to remember it anyway. Kingdom, phylum, class, order, family, genus, species. Is that clear? And where the name came from? Which one of those? Seven? Genesis and species. So when you talk about the names, the scientific name, if you ask yourself where the, this scientific name came from, they call it the binomial nomenclature. What's bi means? Nomial means name. Binomial means the double name. It comes from Genesis and species. Remember this. This is very important. And we will use it all the way down. It comes from Genesis and species, right? Genesis has to be capitalized. It has to be uppercase. You will see that. And the species has to be lowercase. It has to be. And it has to be italicized and, um, or underlined. You have to do one of those. Look at this. Staphylococcus. Aureus. Staphylococcus is the genesis. Aureus is species. Did you notice that this is uppercase and this is lowercase? Yes. It has to be like this. Did you notice that it's italic like this? Or it can be underlined? You have to use one of those. Otherwise, it's a wrong scientific name. This is how it goes. Staphylococcus aureus, the other way around, it can be used for anything. You can, you can use the first letter 
of the uh, of the genesis like this uppercase still dot and the species so which one of those is correct both of them you can do it like this or you can do it like this is that clear since this is the binomial nomenclature genesis species genesis is capitalized species is not capitalized it has to be either uh, um, uh, italicized or underlined one of those and you can put the whole name or you can put the first letter but in all cases the first letter has to be capitalized uh, this is not part of this but just um, uh, it's something that I added that you need to know mm -hmm. like protesta that was in the previous uh, slide is a unicellular euca eukaryote without a cell membrane What's eukaryote means? Does it have a nucleus, a nuclear membrane? Yeah. Yes. So it does have, but it's unicellular. So this is, um, uh, this is one of the uh, uh, smallest thing, and just it doesn't have a cell wall. So if you look at this, protesta here. The protesta is unicellular. It's eukaryote, but no cell membrane. Okay, and that's it for this chapter.